I'm Sherry Werb, and I'm the director of the Library of Congress's Center for Learning, Literacy, and Engagement. You're here for an event we're calling Chastin Buttigieg Has Something to Tell You. Hint, it's about finding yourself. But first, for those of you here at the festival, if you see a survey taker roaming around, please take our survey. We're very interested in learning from you and incorporating your thoughts into future national book festivals. I also want to thank the James Madison Council for sponsoring the Inspiration Stage. We hope you'll join us at the library's Thomas Jefferson Building on Thursday nights for our popular Live at the Library series. Every Thursday night, we keep the Jefferson Building open late, and you can visit exhibits, explore architecture, grab something to eat and drink, and participate in a variety of fun events, including a literary costume ball on September 14th, when we encourage you to dress up as your favorite literary character or writer. Ann Patchett and Kate DiCamillo will be in conversation the night of October 19th, and a brand new event called Pick Your Poison Mystery Night at the Library of Congress happens on October 26th. We want you to know that the Library of Congress belongs to you and is yours to explore. Now back to the stars of the show. Chastin Buttigieg is a teacher, advocate, and husband of former presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg. Chastin's new book, I Have Something to Tell You, is an adaptation for young adults of his earlier memoir. And moderator David Ben. Beno is the Emmy Award-winning lead national correspondent for CBS Mornings, the national broadcast that airs weekdays on CBS. Beno was part of the team that won a national Emmy for Outstanding Live News Program. We're grateful to them both for being here, and now let's welcome them to the stage. Wow. So, hello. Why the adaptation for young adults? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, hello, National Book Festival. This is bonkers. Um, your biggest, your biggest audience yet, right? Yeah, not worried about it at all. Um, <laughs> I wrote the book I wish I would have had in eighth grade. Uh, I thought I was the only gay person in the world when I was in eighth grade, mm. uh, and I really wanted to share that story for younger me and millions of other younger me's around the country who just needed to know that someone had been there, that they had lived through it uh, and they made it. Um, so, yeah. Eighth grade, what was going on then? <laughs> uh, what wasn't going on then? Uh, <laughs> I was obviously deeply in the closet. Um, I was in 4-H, I was showing cows at the county fair pretending to be a cowboy, um, just trying to blend in. And I, I grew up in this really idyllic place, but everything about my life at that point felt like a performance, that I was doing everything to either impress my parents or my peers or to just blend in. And there was so much pain and fear um, just trying to make it, just trying to add it all up. And once I started getting the vocabulary about who I was or starting to understand what was going on, you know, it became more and more aware that it was unsafe to be gay in Northern Michigan at that time. Was there anyone at that time you knew who was gay? No, nobody. I, uh, well, Will and Grace was on television. Uh, Ellen was on television. And so I, when I started getting the vocabulary for it, I thought, well, you can be, you can be gay on TV or, you know, in, New York or Los Angeles, and what I learned from them was that you have to be funny. If you're gonna be gay, instead of being the joke, you Mask. can tell the joke. Mask. Yeah. So I became, I was very performative, obviously. Um, I put on a lot of you know, plays in the basement, and my parents enrolled me in theater, which totally saved my life. But that, to me, was like masking the big secret, right? Um, I could be funny and, and engaging and entertaining, um, and that would distract everyone from the reality. 
No social media channels to go follow someone secretly on your own. No. To see about what being gay and having a life like that is like. No. There was a tragedy, a horrific tragedy in our world that happened yeah. that you watched from not too far away. Tell everybody. Yeah, so right about the time I was learning, figuring out that I was gay, um, Matthew Shepard was murdered. Um, Matthew Shepard uh, was uh, all over the television. Um, a gay college student who was taken by two men in a pickup truck, tied to a fence post, beaten and left for dead. And I was growing up around a lot of pickup trucks and fence posts. And I was just convinced that if people found out that I was gay, that might happen to me too. Uh, and so that really shaped how I viewed protecting that secret. That it wasn't just about the world not being ready for you, it was that the world might take your life away because of who you are. Who was the first gay person you met other than yourself? Oh man, I, there's, a, there's a chapter in the book about my exchange year in Germany which um, changed everything for me. And I remember other students talking very openly about being gay. <laughs> and it was such a taboo from where I was coming from. Um, and it was so freeing to just be around other people who just talked about it as if it were no big deal. Not a big deal. And of course now, there are so many people that I graduated with who are gay. Uh, super queer, graduating class of 2007. <laughs> Nobody knew it. We had teachers who were gay who weren't out. But that was the thing, everyone was so convinced that we all had to live in secret, uh, that you could not share that information with the world. What a difference it would have made to have known that I had teachers who were gay or peers who were gay and it wouldn't have been a big thing, but instead it was the one thing I focused on, the one thing I thought about every single day. Do not let these people find out that you are gay or you'll lose it all. What was life like at home then? Well, life was, this is the hard part about the story, life was great. Being the kid that I thought my parents wanted me to be. Um, my parents worked very, very hard to give us everything we wanted. Um, so I was on the bowling team, you know, I was in 4-H. Uh, don't snicker at the bowling team, <laughs> snicker. How dare you? Uh, uh, you know, I, we, we were a very active family, you know, camping and, um, but I was just hiding. Um, but very, very loving, dedicated parents, but we just didn't talk about being gay. That's the thing. Had my parents sat me down and had a 10 second conversation, um, which I urge every parent to do, you know, had we sat down and just said, it's okay to be who you are. We want you to know that. Whether you want to dance or be on the football team or do both or whether you're gay or straight, we will love you unconditionally no matter what. But we just didn't have that conversation. And so I was convinced that their love was conditional that all of the things I was doing to impress them would as long as I were straight. Their love was not conditional, you later learned. Yes. Your mother is here. My mother is here today. Where is she? Right there. In the front row. In the front row. When and how did you learn the love was not conditional? Uh, I came out to my mom, I wrote a letter um, but at that time, I had, I had already packed my bags, um, just sort of convinced that it was over. Um, and not because I was afraid that my parents would say, you know, no son of mine is gay, get out of the house. I, I was more convinced that I would be such an embarrassment to them. Um, my parents are, talk about celebrities, like it is hard to go anywhere with Sherry and Terry Glesman in Traverse City, Michigan. Um, they just know everybody, and I was so worried that they would, you know, people would learn, well, Sherry and Terry's son, you know, is gay, and it would be an embarrassment to them, and they would lose family or friends. Um, and so I, I gave her the letter, and I, and I left. I, I remember it was so, it was sunny out, the windows were open, there were bed sheets on the clothesline on the back deck. Um, mom was sitting in her recliner watching television. Um, and I handed her the letter and I, I just said, I'm sorry. And that, that's all I knew to say. I couldn't think of anything else to say. Uh, and I ran and there was a lot of confusion about 
why I left, and I was just so scared. Um, and I found out that their love wasn't conditional when they had found out that I was sleeping on friends' couches and occasionally sleeping in my car, um, and they wanted to keep me alive. Um, I was in a pretty rough spot, and they didn't know anything about raising a gay son. Um, but they put all of that prejudice and fear aside and called me home. Mom called me home. Um, I will never forget my, my little blue flip phone ringing, driving my little Mitsubishi minivan. <laughs> um, and, and she called and said, just come home and we'll figure it out. Mm. Um, and I did. I, I drove right home and I just collapsed in her arms. I have such appreciation for seeing her sit in the front row and clap with the look on her face that she has now this many years later. Yeah. The beauty and the gift of this book is that it helps us see something of ourselves in your story. Yeah. And that's such a gift to give. I remember when my grandmother died, she wrote a letter to my mother saying, do your best to understand David. And I think that was her way of wow. saying with the language she had at that time that there's something different. Yeah. Your grandmother <laughs> yeah. was a very special soul to you. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> uh, I feel like this is a common thing I hear around the country when I say, when I came out, everyone said, you know, we'll deal with that, um, but don't tell grandma, it'll kill her. <laughs> like, so many people tell me that they were also told to not tell their grandma because they thought it would kill her, and, um, which is also a great title for a book. Um, <laughs> uh, nobody take that. I want to workshop it. Um, that was the thing, was like slowly coming. I felt like I owed it to everybody to come out, to come out to my cousins, to come out to my aunts and uncles, and, um, which is bogus, by the way. I talk about that in the book. I feel like we need to raise a generation of young people who know that that is their information to share. You do not have to come out if you don't want to come out. Um, but while I was on my apology tour for you know being gay, everyone was like, don't tell grandma, it'll kill her. And I love my grandma. I, I, I think we had a really special relationship. I, I always went to church with her, not because I was extremely devout, but because there was free breakfast afterwards. And um, we just, we had this great bond. And um, it kills me not sharing this piece of information with her. I felt like she didn't know the real me, the true me. Um, and it was Thanksgiving, I believe, where we were, we were at a family function and I asked her to go for a walk, and we wound up in the front seat of her car. Um, her rosary was dangling in the rear of your mirror, um, and I said, Grandma, I, and, you know, I just, I couldn't find the words, I just started crying. And she, she wore like really heavy jewelry, um, really big rings, and she reached across the car and squeezed my arm so tight, I could feel them digging into my arm. And she said, I know Chassers, that was my nickname. I know Chassers, and I love you just the same. Oh. Um, and it, it was, it was um, really special for her to know that, and she spoke at, she spoke at our wedding, she read the gospel at our wedding, um, and then passed a couple months after that. And it was, uh, it, was, it was so special to know that this woman I loved and admired so much loved me and admired me equally back and not to hide myself from her. If you wrote a letter to the eighth grader, what would you tell him? Oh, just to take a breath, you know. Um, I write in the book about how one day you're going to grow up and you're going to go to Target and someone's going to interrupt you and tell you that they went to high school with you and you are going to have no idea who that person is. <laughs> um, but I was so convinced in eighth grade that that person's opinion was the opinion that mattered the most. I was so terrified of what they thought about me. And I wish that eighth grader would have known that it was okay to be different. It was okay to be goofy or loud. Um, it was okay to stick out. But back then, it felt like you had to be one type of person. Um, and I just wish I would have been able to live into all of those differences, to just lean into my differences and be celebrated for that as well. Uh, imagine what life would have been like had I not spent you know, 22 years 
running away from myself. Now, it's fine and everything, but then you had to go be the husband of the first gay presidential candidate. <laughs> That's so rude, right? Um, you know, I was just, I was just getting going you were my just teaching getting career. Going. Uh, yeah, how the hell has that been? We only have 27 minutes left, and that's a, um, <laughs> it's, been, it's been great. It's been everything, you know. Um, it, of course, it can be really difficult and scary, uh, but it, it is also very inspiring. Um, but through the lens of being the first gay couple, right? Yep. I mean, there's so many firsts along those way. Yeah. Um, it's been really powerful to connect with people because of that historical fact, mm. uh, people who are of an older generation who never thought that they would see this day. Um, that was very meaningful for me when he was running and being in DC. Um, and then being able to write stories like this and tour the country and, and, and work with librarians and teachers uh, and have these conversations with younger people about not being afraid to be themselves. Um, and it, I never thought that I would be this person. I never thought that I would um, you know, be talking about politics on, on late night news or, you know, defending LGBTQ rights. Uh, but I'm glad I get to be this person. I'm, I, I'm really glad I got to grow up and celebrate who I am openly. And that, that journey for me um, was, was long and, and it was bumpy and sometimes terrifying. But now I get to turn around and think about how we have to continue pulling other people up. Um, I remind myself of the privilege that we have to be in this position. And you gotta ask yourself as an ally, what are you doing to deserve that, that title? Um, to be an active ally. I don't think it's enough to just occasionally post on social media or buy the shirt at Target, if you can still buy it at Target. Um, but you have to ask yourself, how am I using my power or my privilege and my platform to help other people? I think it's a misconception when you're gay. Some people might assume that as you get older, the insecurities just go away. Oh. <laughs> does the, Who says that? Does the writing of the book, and there will be more books to come, yeah. does it help keep that insecurity at bay? Well, I mean, in, in public life, I've just kind of, kind of decided I have to be myself, my authentic self. I can't pretend to be somebody else. I mean, I did that for a long time. I wrote a book about it, you should read it. And um, <laughs> I just want people to, to know that, or just to, I guess I'd say like, I want you to like me for me. And if you don't like me, well at least you don't like me and not the character I'm pretending to be in public life. Um, and so when you, when you lean into that and just say, I, I can't go out there and pretend to be somebody else. Um, it's sort of freeing in a way that I, if you, when you live in public life, you just, you are constantly calculating, constantly. Um, what store you shop at, the people you're surrounding yourself with, um, the outfit you're wearing when you step out of the, the door uh, in the morning, you're constantly making calculations about how the world is going to perceive you. And if they're going to perceive me in any way, at least I would like for them to just see me. Mm. Um, and I, I don't want to be constantly calculating um, about the character, if that makes sense. It does, it does. The anti-LGBTQ book bans, right, that we're seeing across the country. Yeah. You're a little passionate about that. Yeah, because books save lives. I mean, I can't imagine what it would have been like. I mean, I used, I used to hide in the library like many other geeks, hey, and um, what would it have been like to go into the library at Traverse City West Middle School or High School and say, um, you know, I think I'm gay or I just feel alone. Um, and this book just isn't for LGBTQ students, this is for everybody, anybody who's ever felt alone or like a fish out of water. Um, what, what would it have done for me if the librarian was like, oh, I really like this book, you know, check this book out and it's a story that would have been similar to mine. You know, books are mirrors and windows, right? An opportunity to see yourself reflected on the page or the opportunity to peer into somebody else's life. I hope this book accomplishes both. But if younger me would have had access to a book that just made me feel okay in my own body, it would have been profound. Do you think your book will be banned? 
I mean, it's a completely age-appropriate book. I'm a teacher and a dad, and so I know my audience, I know who I'm writing for. So I should say, if somebody does challenge it, it's purely for political reasons. Um, what's happening right now is, it's, it is not about books. It's just about using the LGBTQ community as a scapegoat for an entire political party that has lost its moorings. They have no idea. <laughs> These are people who say they care about protecting our kids. And so they go after the most vulnerable kids in America. And if you say that you care about protecting children and you won't raise a finger on gun violence, the number one cause of death amongst young people in this country, then your priorities are way out of whack. I, I have been to th over 35 cities with this book this year, and almost every city I have an opportunity to sit down uh, with, with students in that city and talk about what matters most to them. And every single place I go, whether it's Texas, Florida, heard of her, Missouri, <laughs> Tennessee, anywhere I go, kids are the number one topic on their mind is gun safety. Mm. Um, it's not about LGBTQ people, but they have found something that works. They, they threw everything at the wall. They wanted to see what would stick. And it's attacking LGBTQ people. I think one of the most beautiful things about the book as well is it is not just a window for a gay person to see something of themselves in your story. It's also a book where allies, Absolutely. people who are straight, can read it and learn. I wish my mom would have had this book. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. She, she She's not said, paid to say I that. wish I would have had that book. Yeah. yeah. I wish I would have had that book. I wish I could have just handed that to my family when they were asking all the the right questions and the wrong questions and the embarrassing questions. And I wish there would've, would've been a way to say, well, just read this and maybe you'll understand what it's like to live in this body right now. What it's like to go through the world wondering whether or not people will love you or whether, whether you will ever know love or friendship or family um, just because of who you are. And the reality is when a lot of people come out, their parents have all kinds of questions and the one thing you want to say to them is, I'm still trying to figure it out too. Yeah. Like, yeah. we're on the same journey. Yeah. I, I wrote uh, in the back of the book, there's a couple pages of reflection questions and discussion prompts because I didn't want the journey in the book to end uh, at the end of the story. I, I, I also taught eighth grade, and so I did a little legwork for you teachers. Uh, but I want, there are specific questions in the back. Like, do you think it is the responsibility of LGBTQ people to come out? Let's talk about that. Um, I, I want that discussion to go further, and especially for parents uh, of LGBTQ people, that is an opportunity for you to dig a little bit deeper into that thinking. There were moments where you were suicidal Yeah. over the years. What age? Oh, um, young. Uh, yeah. Um, what protected you from that I, I mean I knew I, I, I knew where the gun safe was and I looked at it a lot but I something in me I wanted to know what it was like to be loved I just I, I think younger me just desperately wanted to know what that feeling of belonging truly felt like, because everything, like we had talked about, sort of felt conditional. My friendships weren't real or true or deep. And I think I just wanted to know what it would feel like to be truly loved for, for who I am. Um, and as I got older, once I, once I came out, you know, it's that saying, it gets better, bothered me so much. People would say, well, it gets better. And I was like, when? I, it sucked yesterday, you know, and the <laughs> forecast doesn't look any better tomorrow. And I'd get really frustrated, but the only way it got better was because other people committed to making it better. 
It wasn't because I made it better for myself. It was because my friends told me that it was okay to be myself. Mm. And my friends knew that I was in a very dark place and continuously reminded me that I was loved mm. for who I was. That my parents put aside prejudice or fear of rejection from their friendship and community or church because they wanted to keep their kid alive. It's because other people surrounded me that it got better. And that is something I think we all need to think about, how we are continuously trying to make it better for other people. You can't just look at an eighth grade kid who's coming to you wondering, will it ever add up to anything? Why should I stick around? And you can't just say, well, you know, it'll get better. What are you gonna do to make it better for that kid? What are we all going to do as allies to commit ourselves to active allyship? Again, how are you making it better for other people? It's just something to noodle on. Um, and that is how I stuck around. This may sound crazy, but I wanna know if it is your experience. I remember growing up, I avoided relationships with people who were gay because if I became friends with them, I felt like it would guarantee that I was that which people didn't like. Oh, and so I avoided that. Was that in any way your experience? I mean, growing up gay in Northern Michigan is pretty isolating in general. Um, were there any gay neighbors? No. Well, not that I knew of at the time. I mean, um, uh, there was one kid in school who wasn't out, and it was that those terms, those slurs that were thrown around. And I write in the book about how we all watched him take, you know, bear the brunt of most of those slurs and attacks. And then rather than standing up and surrounding him and saying, that's not right, we don't treat people like that, we all just duck. Exactly. And we let, and we let him take it. Because right. if, you, if you stuck up for him, then you were probably one yourself. They were gonna point the right? finger at you. And that's what I write about in the book. When these kids would gang up on you in the locker room or in the hallway and they'd shove your face into a locker or throw you to the ground and call you the F slur, I wasn't convinced that I could go to the principal's office and say like, this is messed up because I thought he probably hated me for that reason too. Mm. And so when we're talking about allyship, like if you are in administration or you know, uh, positions of power, how are you using those positions to make sure that those around you know that it is okay to be themselves? Has putting the words on paper been healing in some way? Oh, healing, terrifying, uh, a little bit of everything. Um, just knowing that it's out there in the world, like you can never take it back, right? But healing in the sense that that young kid would have never believed you <laughs> if you would have told him that one day, one day you're gonna get through this, um, you're gonna fall in love, you're gonna get married, you're gonna have twins, you're gonna write a book about it, and then you'll be at the National Book Festival. With your mother, <laughs> yeah. with your mom. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. We've hit the 15 minute mark, and I'd like to start landing the plane as we start to welcome questions. So if you will get ready, and we'll have you come up to the microphone, uh, and we'll start taking some questions right away. When you talk about that kid, I mean, again, you could have never imagined traveling here with your mother for <laughs> yeah. a conversation about this yeah. to celebrate you being you. No, no, and I, I loved my mom. I adored my mom as a young person, and I was so terrified that I would lose that friendship, that, that relationship with someone that loves you dearly. I mean, the worst thing we've had to deal with is we didn't get peanuts on our flight last night, so, you know. Um, we should talk to somebody about that. But, uh, but just knowing that you have a parent in your corner, knowing that you have a family that supports you and loves you unconditionally, it makes everything else easier. I mean, my life got so much easier when I knew that I had my people in my corner, mm. that I could go home, and that I could express my truest self to my family out of um, not, you know, not fearing that they would you know, be embarrassed of me, uh, which was the big fear when I was growing up. We'll try and get in as many questions as we can, so if you'll get right, right to the point, okay. right to the question, yes ma'am. Hi, thank Hi. you very much for writing your book. Um, you talked about when you went and got your master's. It gave me a lot of confidence when I went to get mine. Hey, so thank you. And congratulations. I just, thank you, and I just wanted to ask you also about 
when it feels like there's such a backlash about yeah. against LGBT rights, for instance, or against environmental protections, or just what keeps you confident? What helps you keep keep fighting the good fight? Yeah, well, the, the thing right now, and it's always easier said than done, um, I, <laughs> I remember that these people are on the wrong side of history. Not, not just that, but that the majority of American people support LGBTQ equality. So this party, this political party, has decided to rail against this idea that the majority of Americans support. Uh, and it's, it's not grounded in reality, right? They're coming up with all of these um, silly things to, to, to spark outrage and, and to stoke fear, but the majority of Americans are on our side. And wherever I'm at in the country, I just meet people who are so exhausted with the nonsense. Politics is supposed to make your life better and safer. If you are in a position of power, your job is to go to those big white buildings in Washington or your state capitol and work to make people's lives better and safer so you can focus on getting your master's or, or teaching or raising a family. But instead, this, this party is just lost. They're, they have no idea what to do anymore because the majority of Americans aren't on their side. And so there, there's, one, there's that reminder that this is not grounded in, in true reality. Uh, and then I stay off social media as much as I can. Uh, I have two-year-old twins, and so the easiest thing I do now is just I get to turn the phone off and play with my kids, and they remind me of what's real, of what matters. The most important job I have right now is being a good dad. And so showing up for the people in my life is better than arguing with you know, somebody with a cat emoji on Twitter. You just have to remember that, like, when have you ever seen on Twitter someone be like, wow. I see it from your perspective now. Mm. Thank you so much for that insight. So like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a losing battle out there. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I read your, your memoir, your longer memoir. I was yeah. really affected by it. And Thank uh, you. I just want to say how much I enjoyed it. And one of the many things that I was affected by was your struggles in your 20s um, financially. You yeah. know, how you talked about having a lot of student loan debt, sort of unwitting, unwittingly kind of accumulating a lot of debt and then taking jobs that you liked but didn't, didn't pay maybe, you know, uh, enough for you to be able to live and the, the bad cars and <laughs> multiple jobs. Thank you for and, reminding me. Yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I thought it was very interesting because right before you came on, we had a speaker called Poverty, you know, by America. Yeah. And I, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I, was really uh, affected by the way that you talked about that because you talked about it so from a personal yeah. perspective and it made you know you know those older people see yeah. oh this is what people are going through and and so I was also affected about that in your book oh, as thank well. you thank you yeah the number one conversation I just want to come out of that which I write about in the YA book is is just not pressuring students to run into college I mean, growing up I was sold the American dream means bachelor's degree and it just, you know, in anything. So I chose something extremely lucrative. I chose theater. And um, it was just like go to college, finish college, and then, you know, and then everything, all the opportunities open up to you. And I wasn't ready for college. I was living in the back seat of my car. Um, I should have been focusing on my mental health, repairing my relationships, and, and getting to a place where then I could study. But it was like go, go, go. And I, I had. Um, a support system, thank God. I did have a safety net if I needed it, like many kids don't. But I was told, the promise was, go to college. And so I went to the financial aid office and I took them at face value. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and yeah, I, I shouldn't have done that. Mm. And I wish I would have had mentors in my life telling me that it was okay to pump the brakes, take some time, figure out who you are, what you're passionate about, and then go to school. Yes. So first of all, I just want to say thank you because yeah. I am going into eighth grade next year. Hey. So uh, first of all, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but Best I of luck. <laughs> it's not going to be that good. When you uh, laugh, it won't give them confidence. <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, but my question is, what? Oh, do you think uh, school police 
are, can help with the situation and what do you think we need to change in order for uh, protection officers to actually help with what's going on? Yeah, I think that's a really, um, I mean, that's very specific to every school and every community because obviously every community and, and every school or district will have a different type of relationship with police. But I think one of the larger conversations that we should be having is about keeping kids safe in general. But one of the things that I think we can help um, that I think would be helpful, when I, was, when I was a teacher, my classroom was surrounded by windows on three sides. And I knew that the lockdown drills I was running wasn't gonna do anything to keep me alive or keep my kids alive, that if somebody wanted to do something bad, they were going to do it. And so the conversation, I think, uh, just, it, it just needs to be about the guns. It's about the guns. Um, those things wouldn't happen if people didn't have access to those types of weapons. Um, the, the, re the relationship with schools and police, like again, is, is going to be difficult and different for, for every school. The number one thing is having all stakeholders involved in that conversation because kids, number one, should feel safe in school. But some kids might not feel safe in that position. So that's a conversation that every community should have for themselves. Yeah. And best of luck in eighth grade. <laughs> Hi, as one of those older generation out gay folks, Hi. Uh, I'm appreciating the, I know reminder's not the right word, but that the work continues because, yeah. you know, I, I'm at least 20 years a, ahead of you and, you know, uh, realizing that, you know, there are eighth graders in Northern Michigan right now who, uh, who are also struggling like I did 40 years ago. Yeah. Well, more than that. Um, <laughs> And my, my last comment is, I'm looking forward to your mom's book. Aww. For, for her journey. Yeah. Because I make up that she, she believes she was doing all the right things for you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Let's go to the gentleman right behind you. Go ahead. So um, I'd love to ask a question just from your perspective as a writer and taking sure. a book that you'd written once for one yeah. audience. What did you need to do to find a way to translate that yeah. to a different audience? What did you take out? What did Good you question. add in? What did you change? Yeah, I actually um, went back and forth with the publisher. I wanted to give the book a new title. Uh, I didn't want to uh, just adapt the language of the story. Uh, so for anyone who's already read the YA version, it's a completely different book. I wanted to rewrite some of those stories and include a lot of new stories because I knew I was just focusing on the younger years and what stories were most important to tell that journey as a young queer person in America growing up in a rural and conservative place? Um, what is the arc of that story, which is very different than the first book? Um, I learned this method from Dustin Lance Black uh, where he writes his stories on um, little note cards and then he arranges them on the floor. And like once he has the story together and then he puts all the cards together and he can write the book. I'm very visual like that, as, as Pete will tell you. I, I had a lot of those old um, giant post-it notes. Do you remember those from school, if there are any teachers? And so our kitchen was like lined in giant post-its for a while uh, because I just wanted to map the story. And when you're talking about your trauma and a story, part of that, that, that trauma is really important, but I also wanted to infuse some of the humor and the lightheartedness because no eighth grader, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> wants to just sit and read about your trauma, you know? How are you gonna make it interesting and, and lighthearted, but also strike the right note? And for me, that was mapping it out and seeing it visually before I started writing. Interesting. Yes. Hi, how are you? Hi, well. Awesome. How are you? I'm good. Um, I guess my question, so as a parent, I'm sure you're yeah. thinking like in a couple years, your kids are gonna read this book, hopefully, and they're gonna roll their eyes and be like, oh, it's dad's book, whatever. <laughs> Um, that is definitely <laughs> Penelope, 100%. I oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess my question would be, like, as a queer person in your marriage, before your marriage, a lot of the socialization we get about how to be parents is so gendered, of, like, these hmm. are mom's duties, these are dad's duties, that kind uh, of thing. What kind of conversations did you have with Pete or even just with yourself about how the labor of parenting will look different now that you're not kind of in that and there's oh, no yeah. 
big precedent about you know how to be two dads and how to kind of share yeah. that. That's a, that's a a I think a lifelong journey, and also it's very different um, when your husband worked for the president. So. Um, <laughs> No, 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 sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, he does do more laundry than I do. I will give him that. I am very good at getting it into the dryer. Um, so I understand what you're saying about like the gendered role. And I, just to zoom out a little bit, the idea that parenting is very gendered is something that we're already experiencing in the having those conversations with our kids. I did not know, parents, you can laugh, that I was going to be having these conversations with my two-year-old. Um, especially about mommies and daddies. And they're clear, they are given so many books, uh, and they read so many books at daycare about mommies and daddies. Um, and so I actually started writing a book with two dads so that we can have um, just a little more representation in front of our kids, that some parents have two moms, some parents have two dads. Families look different, but it's not just about all families are different. It's about just seeing my family reflected on the page of the book where I'm not the difference. I'm just the family. And so we want to have more books for our kids and for everyone's kids like that. So that's the next project. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a little bit easier for, for everyone's family. Two minutes, if oh, you can gosh. get right to the question. You talked about, sorry, you talked about um, pretending to be somebody else for a very long time and yeah. then coming to the place where you were leaning into your authentic self. So what was that process of finding yourself? What was that like for you? How did you do that? Uh, just jumping off the cliff, I, I left Iowa uh, in 2019, and I said, I'm going home, I need to take a break, and um, I, I just told Pete, who, he totally agreed, I said, I can't do this pretending to be somebody else, and I, it's not, I, there were many people uh, around me that would say things to me like, go home, let him win, and then you can be first gentleman. And I did not want to live that life. I was not going to hide who I was. And I, I had to go home, take a break, catch my breath, and say, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be myself. We should make a commitment to being ourselves. Um, and if people like that, great. And if they don't, don't. But it was kind of just like you know, plugging your nose and jumping in off the deep end and hoping that it worked. Um, and it, it was very scary. Um, but being, I believe, in that sort of radical vulnerability, the more vulnerable you are, the more it invites people into your story, the more it shows people that someone's been there, somebody gets it. Um, but that doesn't come without fear. And I think to that point, I would sort of end on this note, I can admire your successes, but I will relate to your struggles. Oh. And you've given us a book that people can relate to. Thanks very much. A lot of people can relate to. Thank you. Well, Thank it you. has been such an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.